opening just to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I am Julie Lemoyne. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders here at MedVR with many other people. And uh, just so you know why I might moderate something like this, I have uh, over 15 years in applied XR as a background, and I've worked with more than 25 organizations to strategize and use XR in their uh, businesses or their education or their government agencies. Um, and I actually am finishing up, everyone willing, um, a PhD in applied XR in health and well-being. And I'm doing a lot of work in, uh, in that area. I am privileged to be an Irish Research Council scholar. Uh, and I'm working at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center at UMass Medical School to do my field research. Um, I know for a lot of you who are joining us now, I'm going to give a brief description of MedVR because we're a new organization. Um, so we are centered on sharing knowledge and trying to bring together um, new applications for augmented, virtual, and mixed reality and other forms of XR. Um, and so what we're doing is we're seeding the healthcare community uh, along with the technology community to try and bring it together to create the future of technology in this, in this field. Um, this webinar is part of an ongoing um, activity that we have in order to lead up to our 2021 hackathon, where we hope that seeding the community and bringing more knowledge to everyone helps us innovate even further with a hackathon uh, in 2021. Um, in, in that area, I, I wanna share with the folks that are on the, the call now that I think, um, let me just pick the date. Yeah, October 21st, uh, we're gonna announce a new education curriculum that's gonna run from January to the hackathon next year. Um, so that's going to be really great. It's going to be uh, an intensive, free, and yet taught by experts curriculum uh, for healthcare and technology pros. Um, so keep your ears out for that one. We've done a lot of work. It's pretty amazing. We have uh, experts from around the world in that area. So this community is all about trying to grow a unique, diverse community um, to build up to our hackathon. Um, and I would say, however, uh, none of this happens without sponsors. Uh, so just to say hey to our sponsors, uh, if your organization would like to be a sponsor, of course, we want to hear from you. Um, so, uh, and our uh, talks are up on MedVR. Um, in, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Actually, I might go back. So let me just do a back page up and talk about today. Um, so um, before we get started, we still have people coming. Um, I will announce this again uh, as we get started, but um, the, there are two ways to talk during this uh, webinar. One is in the Q&A, uh, &A, and that's, we would very much like it if you have a question for speakers, um, and I will help with these. We'll uh, moderate those at the end of the talk. We have plenty of time for that. We'll have 15 minutes at the end, um, and we can go another 15 minutes into the next hour. Um, please put your questions, click the Q&A, and put your questions in there if you have questions for the speaker. The other way is to talk in chat, and that's sort of like talk amongst yourselves, enjoy each other, um, share your comments about it, um, and that's the way that we'll do it. So uh, use the chat like any other kind of webinar, and use the Q&A for the speakers, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce two trailblazers today, and as I mentioned, Dr. Martin may be a little bit late. He had a, a procedure to do. Um, so the first is uh, Dr. Martin, uh, who is definitely, I like the term trailblazer for both gentlemen, uh, in the use of AR in the OR and is a radiologist at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so he is absolutely a pioneer in the use of AR, augmented reality, in surgical navigation, and in fact uh, is known as the first surgeon to have used AR during a human liver uh, tumor removal procedure in 2018. Oh, and there he is. He's joining us now, so we're delighted to have him. Um, the other gentleman today is uh, Mina Fahim, and he is also a trailblazer. There he is. Um, and he is the CTO for Mediview. Um, and he comes to Mediview after five years at Medtronic. And then even before that, he was working at St. Jude Medical, creating cardiovascular implants. So he's not only an expert in the field, but he's also a super trailblazer in early applications of AR and surgery and has worked with Dr. Martin as well as other surgeons. So these two folks were so lucky to have them. They're very, very busy. Um, and so I, in, in trying to come up with a good way to enable them to share all this knowledge with you at a, at a good level, um, we came up with this uh, 
three-part webinar. So first we'll ask the two trailblazers that we have here to talk about how they got to now. A little bit about their journey of getting to now and creating the, <coughs> the tools as well as using them. Um, and then the uh, second part will be AR surgery, um, which is more what they're doing right now and it'll probably mean um, a lot on you, Dr. Martin. Welcome. I just gave you an illustrious welcome, Dr. Martin. So uh, there he is, still in your scrubs. We're legit here, if nothing else, right? <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, can you hear us okay, Dr. Martin? Oh, we can't hear you, so we'll let you get your audio going. Okay, oh, can you hear me now? We can. Welcome. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm almost done with my intros, and then we'll get you guys going if you feel comfy. Um, so I already gave you an illustrious introduction, um, and it was awesome, even if you missed it. Um, and then the three parts will be the journey to get to now, then how they're using uh, augmented reality and surgery today, and then the final part would be where, where we're heading, um, just enabling these trailblazers to give us some vision. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can see the people a little bit better. Um, and I'm gonna just kick it off with, um, maybe with you, Dr. Martin, if you'd like to talk to us about um, how you got to now. Um, um, in other words, how did you meet um, um, and greet with the tools that you're using today in the OR that are AR oriented? Um, and how did you meet Matthew and uh, Mina and, you know, that kind of storyline? Sure. So, uh, once again, sorry for running a little bit behind. Uh, I apologize. But, uh, you know, thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk today. Um, so, uh, everything kind of started, um, I guess, close to about three, three and a half years ago, where um, working with uh, some of my colleagues over here in the biomedical engineering department at the Cleveland Clinic, we um, we were interested in uh, using uh, augmented reality just in general, and um, as as we were kind of uh, talking about you know some some utilization, you know they they kind of reached out to me, and I kind of reached out to them uh, just through mutual contacts around kind of how to how to bring this technology to healthcare and how to kind of use it. Um, as as an interventional radiologist, I do procedures uh, using image guidance, and it was uh, kind of one of these things where I think we take for granted the fact that we we look you know we we treat three dimensional patients. We look at uh, you know three dimensional images on two dimensional screens, converted in our heads, and then perform procedures um, in in uh, you know in in three dimensions. And uh, you know I think AR actually kind of brings that back. AR kind of allows us to to make that happen. Um, so through through the biomedical engineering team here at the clinic. Uh, they they were working with uh, the, the the Mediview team, um, and uh, Mediview itself as a company had started uh, out of uh, out of the clinic, and uh, um, that that's kind of where things were where, where where things began, and kind of how we how we started working, and uh, after that it it's uh, you know once once Mina came and uh, things really just kind of picked up to this amazing pace where we're actually able to to do procedures. Um, you know, kind of with uh, utilizing uh, augmented reality to, to uh, you know, kind of help us kind of complete the task. So, uh, Mia, maybe you want to add a little bit to that storyline because I know you came and you had a lot of places to go. Like you came from Medtronic to Metaview, um, and give us a little bit of your your story coming in there, um, and then I'll see if you can talk to me about the the research side of moving from prototype into. Um, into usable product during surgery, you know, because that's a lot of our audience is interested in that, that like research part, like how do you get it out of the lab? How do you get it out of prototypes, right? Yeah, no, that's a, that's great. And, you know, Dr. Mar gave a great intro and I, you know, humbly wanted, you know, recognize all the work that he and the Learner Research Institute did to really get this specific technology off the ground, um, even before I joined the company. And, my background really um, is in biomedical engineering and prior to Mediview, I was leading the mixed reality initiative um, at Medtronic uh, for the cardiac division specifically. And the, the, the feasibility of what AR could bring um, intra to intra procedural use, there's amazing um, technologies for preoperative use, 
uh, for preoperative planning, um, image visualization, but the space and uh, my first introduction to, to actually virtual reality before I got introduced to AR um, was a friend of mine who had his first uh, Oculus system. I don't like heights and he put me on a mountain. And I was like, oh my goodness, my, I saw my hand, my palm started cramming up, I was starting to sweat. I was like, oh my God, get me out of this thing. Um, but it was incredible, right? And not because I was still scared, but as I was driving home, I had to call my wife and I was like, I think I just saw the future of healthcare. She's like, what are you talking about? I don't get it. And I was like, well, I got put on a mountain and I got really scared, but I felt like I was really there. She's like, how does that have anything to do with healthcare? Um, long story short, um, I, you know, serendipitous stories are coming up that we, um, a friend and I um, at work applied to, um, we actually were not awarded the grant, but that didn't stop us. We actually found an internal champion who um, later was a leader in the organization and she saw the potential. I, um, I really admire her vision for allowing us to do this. She's like, okay, you guys have intrigued me enough. Um, here's, here's a small amount of seed funding. Uh, go see if, see if you can make this happen. So we actually went off, we, I got introduced to HoloLens and Magic Leap and um, we started really exploring and we uh, pulled out a really old piece of capital equipment that literally we had to uh, brush the, the dust off and start figuring out how do we make real time data interface in these augmented reality environments. Um, and uh, that was really our beginning. Um, I was then asked to go out and uh, judge a competition where the current CEO of MediView, John Black and Dr. Martin were pitching. Um, it was incredible. They did an awesome job. Um, I was not biased at the time. I'd been following MediView, but I actually had been researching healthcare AR companies, had looked into over 50 of them, done due diligence on some, actually had an opportunity to join two others. But then once I, you know, I'd been a familiar with MediView and John essentially, uh, you know, ambushed me after the, after the time. <laughs> yeah. Said, hey, um, I'm John Black. Um, I'm part of the you know, this company, MediView, and uh, we're looking for someone to help take this technology from concept to commercialization. Um, and that's really how I ended up uh, where I am today with the, with the, the blessing and benefit of working with people like Dr. Martin, John, and the co-founder Adam and the rest of the MediView team to really realize the productization of AR at the point of care for helping deliver surgery. Okay, so let's just hear about that just a little bit, the productization part. Um, so I don't know how much work that you or Dr. Martin had to do in order to be able to use it in the OR. I'm really interested in that area of the journey to now. If you want to comment on that, either of you or both of you. Dr. Martin, why don't you start, Ray, with how you guys got the ability to start, and I'll, and I'll chime in after. Yeah, so, you know, it, that's, it, it's really kind of fun and interesting. It, it was one of those things that had kind of started around, um, you know, we were looking for, uh, you know, what, um, what intervention would this be most helpful to, you know, how would AR be most impactful you know, kind of in the in the healthcare space, or at least what we thought would be the healthcare space, um, or you know, in in specific interventions, or, or as interventions go. And um, as we were looking, uh, one of the procedures that uh, that I perform are uh, these image guided interventions called ablations, where we um, place a probe into uh, solid organs or or into soft tissue in in in, in a patient's body, and uh, typically the probe is about the size of the barrel of a pen and um, either burn or freeze the tumor from the inside out. And it's something that right now we use, we use image guidance, but um, it's uh, something that requires kind of uh, dimensionality. Like it, it, tumors, everything is, is, is in three dimensions and um, it's a, still a bit of a work in progress that um, you know, we as, as um, uh, proceduralists and uh, um, as, as well as in the, in the surgical community, they, um, to, to be able to kind of actually kind of treat something in multi multiple dimensions can be kind of challenging. And to do that kind of with the assistance of augmented reality, kind of see where you're going, what you're doing, and how, um, you know, the, the, the kill zone that you create is actually formed could be, could, could be really, really helpful and really beneficial to our patients. So uh, that's kind of how it, how it started. 
Um, and that's kind of where we felt it would be most impactful to begin. Okay, so, so I think, I yeah, guess the, the long answer to your short question was really kind of, uh, um, we, we, we knew we had a great technology and we really wanted to see kind of where it could, it could be most helpful. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and the uh, sort of flip side is that um, it may mean on that one is how'd you get permission to do this? Or maybe it's you, Dr. Martin, like how did you find your way to be enabled to, to be allowed to use it? Um, so, so the way that we, uh, the way things work here is that, um, you know, AR is still utilized, you know, kind of in, in addition with uh, standard of care image okay. guidance. So, you know, the, through, through our IRB, we're, you know, we're still using, um, and honestly, that's, that, that's helpful for us because we're actually able to, um, when we perform these procedures, we actually perform these procedures using, um, uh, using ultrasound, using CAT scan, um, and um, they're, they're, they're used kind of uh, coupled with an electromagnetic field uh, guidance. So it, it's kind of a combination of all of these technologies with AR kind of enabling and uh, really kind of, uh, you know, making, making all, you know, all of this possible in concert. I think that's just a really important point that um, if I can reiterate, maybe Mina, you can comment on that. It's like, it's not that the AR tool is displacing everything else. You know, you don't throw the, the baby and the bathwater out and play with a new rubber ducky, right? Like you, you're using this in addition to, uh, so I'm interested in the outcome too, when we talk about now. Um, so that's, do you have any like nerdy stuff you want to add to that, Mina, around the, the tech itself, evolving the tech to be acceptable for OR? Um, so the questions that usually come up around this for prototyping, just to seed you a little bit, are you know how do you keep things sterile, or don't you need to be sterile with these tools? And you know has COVID impacted anything or made it easier? You know like sort of that area of getting to now. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I want to go back to when I was evaluating the different AR and surgery, surgery technologies. Um, there's a lot of awesome technologies out there, some that even have FDA clearance at this point. Um, but the differentiating factor that I was looking for that Mediview had even before I got there um, was uh, the fact that they incorporated the standard of care imaging as a surrogate, um, as the, sorry, as the primary data source to the AR tools. And that was a really big deal when I was looking at this. I mean, um, if, if people aren't familiar with MediView, our, one of our most unique differentiators is a very novel algorithm and technique that can register uh, within a couple of millimeters holographic content to the actual patient that's on the table in the real world space. Um, and uh, I won't go into um, deep detail on how we do that because that's really um, where we're keeping our secret sauce and, uh, you know, credit to our, uh, pr our principal engineer, Jeff Yanoff, and um, the gentleman that runs the BME lab, Carl West, um, who had developed this technique. Um, and we've mo modified it a little bit since then that it actually um, doesn't even rely fully on the headset's optics because of the uh, science and math underneath the hood that allows us to place these, these holograms. Um, I should be careful calling them holograms, but volumes. Sure. Uh, Spatially, anatomically in the correct position. And the, the really interesting thing is um, it softened the adoption curve or people's willingness to at least think about it. And Dr. Martin was instrumental in getting other specialties. So he's obviously an IR, but uh, bringing other specialties who um, I told him early on, I said, I need you to get us people who are uh, uh, detractors or are doubters of what we're doing. Sure. Right? Great. And when he started bringing some folks who um, maybe were coming purely out of interest um, or uh, were coming to, um, I even got the one comment that I'll just share with everyone was one person came in and said, I was coming in um, waiting and hoping to just, you know, tear apart what you guys were doing. That, that's their attitude coming in. And I think once they saw how our AR environment was mated with the standard of care, um, it really softened the idea of how this would be adopted in healthcare. And that, that um, kind of unique inter interplay between the standard of care, which in this case is ultrasound, we've, we've thought about how we could use all the live imaging modalities combined with uh, either pre-operative or intraoperative 3D visualization um, has really been the key in how people have thought about being encouraged 
right? And that person who I mentioned came in almost wanting to, to really uh, tear, tear apart what we were doing, left saying, well, when can I actually use this more? And that, to me, from a technology and product development perspective is the greatest compliment um, you can get. So that really was the, uh, when we talk about productization, it's um, highlighting how we promote the use of these technologies by um, lowering the, the barriers to adoption or the intimidation factor, if you will, um, mm -hmm. because very few people have actually even used a headset like this uh, in their day-to-day -day life, much less in the operating room, right? Yeah. So, uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, helping with that adoption curve of how we bring people along for the journey. And um, that's been instrumental in working with um, Cleveland Clinic and some of yeah. our other hospitals. Yeah. So I know you guys have a video and it's really amazing. So we'd love to have you share it and speak over it um, as you see fit to explain what's going on. And I'm interested in uh, sharing with the audience whether you're using a specialty headset that is MetaView's headset or if you're using a commercial headset too, or, you know, just uh, let's have that, let's roll the film and let's see how it really works. That'd be great. Can you guys confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. All right. Yep. Put this presentation Super. On. Okay, so this is uh, what we've trademarked as our um, Acuity Holographic Navigation and Guidance System. Um, I'm going to address your first your question, Julie, right away. Uh, we're using an off-the-shelf headset. Um, we're using the HoloLens 2 for this. Uh, we account for different things um, that are, are brought up as limitations around the interpupillary distances and the potential offset between eyes with actual the algorithms that we uh, worked into and how we actually accomplish our registration. So I just wanted to highlight that, again, we are not reliant on the pure optics of these headsets. And that's why we're able to, to use a technology like this. Um, we built it originally on HoloLens 1. We've migrated to HoloLens 2. Um, we've built a simple prototypes of this system with Magic Leap. Um, but, you know, we've had a really interesting um, collaboration with Microsoft over the past couple of years that has helped with this. Um, and I'll play it here. But what you're seeing in this video um, is a first person view from the headset um, on a Phantom right. where this is registered. And, uh, please forgive uh, the the, uh, the stereoscopic offset, right? Because it's recording from one of the lenses um, and not both. So it looks like there's an offset, but I'll let Dr. Martin after this comment on it that typically our registration with the tool and the anatomy is there is that, that offset doesn't really exist when you're wearing the headset. Um, right, you know, offset is forgiven. Thank you. So that's, so what you see here is a uh, phantom uh, uh, that actually we took a CT scan of this anthropomorphic phantom um, with the anatomy um, actually registered to the phantom. And what you'll see is a digital twin of the interventional tool um, that'll track with the real tool as we move it around in the, in the real world uh, space. So if I hit play here, you'll see uh, this is actually our fine uh, surgeon, Mr. John Black, um, going through and actually pre-planning trajectories to different anatomical structures and stamping them in space without even having to enter the body to simplify these procedures. Um, in addition to that, you'll see here we're actually showing a therapeutic zone from a example of an ablation tool that Dr. Martin uses. And if you watch this orange sphere in the middle, as we advance the, the needle to that target, um, it'll actually turn orange right right there, which actually is a closed loop feedback between the imaging and the interventional tool um, that you're in a good location. I'm going to pause right here because this gets to the point earlier, Julie, of your question around how do we get to use this technology in an IRB pre-FDA? And again, we're not making we're not making primary medical decisions on the AR environment. This is how we're leveraging the real time ultrasound component that is also co-registered with the anatomy, the 3D volume. So think of, a, think of a slice of bread and you're taking a knife and you're slicing that slice of bread into, a, a, along anywhere across that loaf. Well, in this case, our ultrasound is like that knife and the CT is like the loaf. And you're, we have an ability to co-register the location of that ultrasound with the, C, the volumetric CT or MRI or ultrasound that we're collecting. So this is a really interesting shot of our technology that really shows the differentiation around the volumetric registration as well as the integration with real-time imaging and 
just to be very clear today, uh, I will say this softly, we are starting to account for respiration and deformation, but the system today, the way we account for the deformation and respiration of the patient is um, in a unique way that I'm not gonna go into right now um, of how we use the real-time imaging from the ultrasound to account for any uh, motion or translation of the patient or the anatomy to adjust the, three, the registration of the 3D. So that's how we're able to, to do that Super. and I'll just let it play out. So you'll see there, and it's kind of the, the nice example of these, these technologies around being able to move around them, visualize them from, from any angle. We're working on UI interfaces that don't require the physician to move around the patient. Yeah. Right? We're doing that through use conditions analysis with our, the first person that we brought on even before our first engineer um, was a user experience designer. Um, that actually helped us break down the procedural steps along with the Learner Research Institute so that we truly understand from a jobs to be done perspective, um, what is the job that the practitioner is trying to accomplish and how can we build our system to facilitate that job. So that's acuity and uh, that's really the, the, the differentiating capability ar around MediView. We have another product that's actually a level simplified from this, but we can talk about that when it's appropriate. Okay, wow. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Not only that, the film is really helpful for the audience to see it too. Um, so Dr. Martin, I think I'm interested in, in the OR itself, are, are you wearing these glasses and having to wear other glasses underneath them? Are you, I mean, a lot of times in the OR, you actually have to have magnifying glasses on and how is that, how's the equipment? What's it like to sort of get it going today in the OR is, and the, the, the questions about sterility and all that kind of address like the using in the OR? Sure, so um, typically when I am using that, I just have my glasses on and then the HoloLens or uh, because I use uh, either fluoroscopy or CAT scan to do other procedures, I have these glasses on which are um, you know, a kind of uh, leaded goggles. And you know, because they're actually quite form fitting um, and you know, I think because of, I think the advanced ergonomics of uh, you know, HL1 and HL2, they actually fit right, you know, on right over the, right oh. over the system. So it actually right. works out really, really nicely. Now, um, you know, with loops, um, I know that I have uh, some surgical uh, colleagues who, um, you know, are, 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 you know, trying to kind of work on, you know, some of the logistics of that. Um, you know, that, that seems to be a little bit of a, a work in progress to kind of figure out how to um, entirely accommodate that. But uh, it, it's well, something about, that. Um, um, excuse me. I wanted to ask about outcomes. Are you are you finding that you know you're putting it on? It doesn't seem like it's too invasive for you um, as the as the user of the technology. But are you finding that it improves outcomes? I, I mean, is there enough research to to state something about its value? So um, anecdotally, uh, we, we actually have a paper under submission right now. We've, we've had um, 11 cases where we've performed uh, procedures in uh, liver, kidney, and uh, soft tissue within the body, um, all, all uh, proved to be successful. Um, what, uh, it, and that was, that was really encouraging. We're um, launching into um, extending that uh, research component uh, just uh, because of that success, as we as we kind of uh, continue to advance the uh, advance the platform, um, and uh, you know one of the things that uh, you know Mina kind of touched on, which uh, I'm, we're finding actually incredibly helpful, um, that I think is not only kind of improving outcomes, but I think is um, also uh, show, is showing um, uh, it's basically kind of improving. Uh, the, the efficiency of the procedure is, uh, you know, when, when you think about those images that we just saw on the video, um, we can actually see the, the ablation zone. And because you can kind of model, you know, kind of what is or what will be, um, I think it extends the power of AR that way. Um, it, it was, it, it's, a, it's a tremendously helpful platform for that, that, you know, I don't think we really appreciated it at first, but as we've um, continue to iterate on on the you know, on the platform. We've been able to kind of uh, show additional enhancements that that are actually also improving uh, improving our outcomes in in different ways that were initially uh, not anticipated. So that's um, a perfect lead into where you think it's headed, 
and what where do you think um i think in this area one of the things we're interested in is you both bring brilliance to the table around the use of ar for patients and for outcomes and have you hit what's the hard nuts and where do you where does it need to go but also you're starting to see the added features that will bring even more so if you guys want to speak a little bit about um what's going to happen over the next few years and and whether or not we've got some really hard things that we just haven't figured out yet um as technologists and and medical professionals so where are we going i guess is the kind of conversation here go ahead dr Mern. oh no please mina i'll, I'll, uh, I'll, let, you, I'll let you start yeah. We, we, we could both talk forever about this, but we, <laughs> we kind of geek out about AR quite often. All right, bring your geek on, because uh, we're all a bunch of geeks here for healthcare and AR and VR and all that, so bring it. So, so for us, you know, on, the, on the commercialization side, you know, let's make, you know, if I make a couple assumptions explicit, right? We believe in our registration algorithm. We believe that technology has proven. I'm going to just echo something that Dr. Martin said. Um, because we're not F the, because the acuity system is not FDA cleared just yet, we are um, engaging in a um, IRB study to collect data, right? That looks at two things around accuracy and efficiency. And th that once that publication is out, then that'll be public information. Um, so we can't make claims just quite yet. But if we make the assumption that the technology works and we know that it works, that for us, some of the limitations are actually we're rolling out a completely new a new interface um, to the customer. Right, so how do you provision these things? How do you secure them? Um, how do you make, are the, is it okay to share them? Um, does each person need their own headset? These fundamental commercialization questions um, are, we're actually starting to tackle them now. Um, and I, you know, one of the things around um, FDA clearance, well, there's a, you know, there's a strategy that many of you is taking to encourage the adoption of AR at the point of care um, around how do we start with a use case or application that has a uh, lower risk profile through different yeah. um, RPN and risk management processes that we're going through. Um, you know, basically what I just showed on, on the Acuity video is like the Ferrari, right? But we have, you know, the Toyota Avalon, beautiful car, <laughs> super comfortable to ride, yeah. right? nice, really reliable, um, but a little bit more accessible than a Ferrari right now, right? And, um, and it's not manual, right? There's a, that's a lost art driving. <laughs> so, so, you know, help partnering with the FDA to introduce a, a capability around what's referred to as our MediScout product um, that facilitates some of the current ergonomic workflow challenges. Mm -hmm. and, stepping through the different uh, regulatory verification and validation steps um, to get it there is there's been some X, you know, I want to call out people in this space. Augmetics has done a great job getting to their 510k. Um, I know a group like CentiR is doing a great job working towards their, their, their clearances and we're doing the same. Um, so it's, it's building up this community of practice within the surgical use of AR that's going to help propel some of these things. So I don't look at the regulatory path as a, as a hurdle, right? It's there to, to protect the patients and honestly the users who are gonna be using this technology. So for us, really the, the challenges from a commercial perspective around how do you provision them? How do you secure them? Um, how is the institution going to look at this headset? Is it gonna be a piece of capital equipment? What kind of purchasing cycle is it going to be on? Um, how do you demonstrate the value? Right, the economic value assessment, we have a very unique approach that we're taking to do that right now, um, collecting uh, procedural as well as reimbursement data to demonstrate yeah. efficiency gains, um, both top incremental top line revenue generation for the institutions, as well as bottom line efficiency gains that can be recognized um, through the product. So if I were to simplify it into the challenges, I would say from a, you know, there's a economic value adoption proving that this actually is beneficial and works. There's obviously technology challenges and how do you roll this out um, and how is it going to be accepted in the field? And then I would say that the third part around working with the regulatory agencies, both FDA and abroad, to um, encourage the adoption of this technology. So that's how we Yeah, that's really useful. That's really interesting. And uh, we had the pleasure of having a speaker from the FDA who was very focused on vision in the headsets mm -hmm. and showing how each headset is slightly off. Um, from where their focal points are. So that work is just like 
you know, you got to give it up to the FDA. They don't just judge it. They've got all these scientists working uh, on this technology too. Um, so the, the where are we headed? A question for you, Dr. Martin. Um, you started saying, well, we've, we've we've seen where it could be even more useful. And are there feature sets though that are, or or for both of you that you can't quite get to yet. Um, some of the interesting things that have come up in the past have been around the notion of really needing haptics, but you have other tools that you're working with at the same time. So where are you seeing this going, those use cases? And then, you know, are there barriers that, you know, we just need more brilliance to overcome? You know, I, I think, oh, you know, we, we as a we as a group, uh, you know, kind of working with uh, you know our research team, the MediView team, we we have a list. I, you know, I could pretty much come up with very real, very um, you know helpful use cases in probably every specialty across healthcare continuum. Um, you know, I think it's just a matter of kind of demonstrating a value proposition, uh, generating a community around it, um, showing access. Um, and, 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 you know, kind of gaining some small wins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Mina did a great job of, uh, you know, also listing, you know, uh, several of our, 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 our colleagues, you know, whether they're in different uh, companies, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the startups who are doing some really tremendous uh, work and have already gotten over the, um, you know, over the finish line to uh, clearance and uh, those others who are actually working to get there as well. Um, I know uh, with regard to kind of success in the space, you know, I, I'm you know, doing all I can to kind of uh, continue to kind of, um, you know, work with and collaborate with, you know, whether they're uh, clinician colleagues or uh, um, others who are evangelists of the technology. I think that, you know, we're going to have to continue to kind of grow out the space. I mean, the work that you find people are doing to really kind of, you know, build build the, the AR, VR community, I think is is tremendous and it's necessary and um i think it's going to be all of those things that are going to kind of get us there to kind of see the the real world uses that are going to make a uh, tremendous impact going forward and um i'm going to ask this one last thing before you move into questions since we've got some questions piling up i'm not surprised um but um is there sort of a um vision that you have that how fast this will be adopted so so some of the um, surgeons and others that I will work with or talk with are like, the minute you figure something out that works well, you're going to be a butcher if you don't use it, right? Like, you know, so so how fast do you you feel this adoption? I, you may have different answers to that, um, you know, I, you know, as a as corporate and Dr. Martin um, as the physician, you may say like, oh, different, you know, we got to do this much research. But do you have a feel for the adoption around this kind of tech? Yeah, you know, I, I, at least I personally feel like adoption, there's going to be kind of two components to, to adoption. I think, uh, you know, kind of demonstrating kind of safety and quality and uh, the demonstrating of, the, of, of value and, um, you know, kind of showing how it can kind of work into, um, you know, kind of into current, uh, current workflows. Everybody knows that uh, healthcare itself has, you know, kind of razor thin margins. And um, you're, you're going to have to show the incre incremental kind of quality, safety, you know, yeah. kind of value that this technology could bring. And, uh, you know, I think we're all going to get there. It's just a matter of kind of, you know, kind of how quick and, you know, kind of can, can we do this in a, in a reasonable period of time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anything yeah. to add? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, it's, I think we're all really lucky to be uh, partners and collaborators in a field where, you know, I'll put a plug for, if you haven't read Crossing the Chasm, you absolutely should. Uh, it's an excellent book from what, and I think we are living a, in the, you know, digital healthcare transformation around whether it's mixed reality, whether it's the, the machine learning, where um, we're getting close to that, you know, that cr being able to, to, to make that leap, right? From, uh, there's definitely some early adopters, Julie, like you said, the We've had the questions, hey, can I get on a podium and talk about this? And can we try this in a, in a patient on Monday when we're showing yeah. them on Friday? And, you know, we have to say, no, no, not, not quite yeah. yet. So even, you know, uh, there's the optimistic outlook, right? Once, once this is commercial ready, right, it'll get, everyone will adopt it, right? I don't fundamentally believe that um, because, you know, my background and my graduate school was all around what does technology adoption look like? And yeah. if we're being realistic, um, you know, it's is mass adoption of this in the OR. 
Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in three to six months. It's going to take a, you know, a couple years to reach the point where people feel free taking the training wheels off. What we can do to help encourage it, though, is look at, you brought up COVID earlier, Julie, and I want to just, you know, mention one thing. One of the capabilities of our, both of our systems that um, we only touched on briefly that I want to maybe reiterate on is um, what we're referring to as teleprocedure. Um, yeah. You know, medicine, there's telehealth, we're coining the term teleprocedure, meaning uh, we have unique ways to enable Dr. Martin um, and a collaborator on the other side to actually annotate on each other's physical environments, um, physically be in the same location, the, the digital content at the same time, annotate over it, have voice, video, annotation capability, and that's a much nearer, right, where in the, in the era of, that we're in right now around COVID and even post-COVID, whatever that actually means, no one actually knows yet, um, this need for being able to reach and deliver quality health care in uh, maybe rural or distant areas that maybe aren't part of a metropolitan um, uh, system or a, a, you know, a, a phenomenal system like Cleveland Clinic, that is an immediate use case. And I just want to yeah. say, this is, for us on the commercialization side, one of my favorite quotes about technology adoption is, um, the best technology is the one that disappears. And we're really trying to not put the emphasis on these headsets. Right, the value isn't the hardware, at least for us, in gaming, in planning, in other areas, it has tremendous benefits in consumer. But for us, when you've got a Dr. Martin trying to do a procedure, our goal is that they don't take that headset off and throw it across the room because you've got a patient on the table. Right. right? So right. that's from the adoption perspective, the more all of us collectively can do to demonstrate the value of how these technologies make the job of the end user. Um, safer, more efficient, and just overall better, then that's what's going to encourage the utility of technology like this at the point of care um, and actually delivering therapy and performing procedures and uh, allowing, you know, a subject matter expert like Dr. Martin to call in to someone who's maybe just starting a practice, right, is, you know, three to six months into a procedure, needs some help, can call them in. And now, you know, the biggest thing that we haven't necessarily talked about is now Dr. Martin sees through the eyes of the end user, right? right? And that's something that current telehealth and teleprocedure technology, which are all excellent, there's a shortcoming there because you can put as many cameras around the room as you want um, and you can switch between their angles and that's really valuable today. But what does that next step look like? And right. now you're in the first person view. So your ability to proctor, facilitate and guide a user who needs a little bit of help becomes that much better. So that's, you know, that's where I think we're going and, and what's going to promote. Well, I think in that area, there's, we could have another whole hour on where like remote guidance, you know, it's like consult to, or mm -hmm. even where AI lives, you know, to replicate some of Dr. Martin's intelligence, right? Like, so it's just, there's so much that's happening right now on these accelerated technologies that is a real, so that's where the science fiction is moving now is the combination of medicine and AR and, and, and AI, you know, that combination which will come, come to fruition over the next 15 years here. So uh, that'll be interesting. And then as we build bots that can behave for you physically, it'll be really interesting. Um, but I want to move into questions. We've got a whole bunch of wonderful questions. I just want to, if you have any last words, and if not, I will start working through the questions with you guys and thank you so much for such an interesting um, conversation. Did you have any last words that you want to share? Shall I just go right into questions for everyone? No, th good? thank you for your time. It's yeah, no, this great. is great. There's a ton of questions. Um, so some of them you may have already answered. Um, and on the hour, guys, we can stay about 15 minutes after the hour to, to answer questions if our speakers can stay. Um, but uh, right before the end of the hour, I'm going to talk about the next talks so that I don't lose the audience because we have a couple of new talks coming up that are really great. Um, but let's just get going. And I'm going to go sort of through order. Um, so we have, um, and if you folks want to see the, the speakers want to see it, you can pop up the q and I don't know if you can see them. Um, and so we'll start with uh, Eno, I think it is. Um, and I think Dr. Martin went through a number of the other applications. Um, but if you just... If you'd like to make another comment on that one, happy to let you see uh, it. Certainly. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, Enio, how are you, buddy? It's uh, nice to hear from me. I could, I could see who uh, wrote the question. Um, so, I, I see a, a whole, a whole host of uh, IR, IR applications. I mean, 
There's, um, you know, the, the, some of the more basic ones around, you know, just kind of a Venus access, but uh, you can get, you know, all the way to the complex, like we're, you know, a, a, as we're doing is such as uh, image guided ablations and such. Um, it really could, it, and, and, you know, IR is just, you know, obviously I have a bias as you know, being an interventional radiologist, but, you know, I see, I see applications across, across the spectrum. So I think uh, on the next one's from Willie, and we already talked about that, the FDA approval, unless you want to say any more about that, that you're in the process, it sounds like. Um, I just want to, I've already said it, I just want to reiterate it. Engage the FDA as a partner, right? They're, they, the FDA is an excellent institution. They want to see good technologies get to the bedside, right? Um, and they just want to make sure that it's done uh, safely and under the right design controls. So uh, it's uh, engage them as a partner. It's actually a really fun process. Um, and I mean, we're engineers, right? So we need to do this rigorously because if, you know, if it's, if it's my grandma or my mom <clears throat> who's getting this technology used on them, right? We want to make sure that it's designed right. So, um, Especially uh, if it's your grandma, she uses VR, right? Is that the, um, so uh, Greg, I don't know whether Greg is proposing a new tool or, um, but if you see, so how about adding a tool that will enable huge and unobstructed finger hand tracking. Um, so uh, I always talk about a little bit about Magic Leap or where he's going with his hand tracking or, so do you, either of you want to take that one on? Yeah, I, I think hand tracking um, in regards to, and forgive me, Greg, if I don't capture the full essence of your question, but yep. I think it's a great topic um, around uh, hand tracking, eye tracking, head pose, um, yeah. You know, in the future, if, you know, we've even talked about body sensors. You know, we're we're creeping closer and closer uh, 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 to uh, Ready Player One, right? Uh, when you have that full body suit, and I know that's you know, maybe it's it's 15, 20 years is even too close. But hand tracking, you know, um, John Black always does this fun, you know, but meaningful um, impression around the position of a person's hand, even just working with the interventional tools, and I can't speak to this like Dr. Martin can, actually has an impact on the outcome of where that tool goes. So if you're able to, over time, and Julie, this connects a dot of what you were saying around the machine learning or computer vision aspect of things. If you have those sensors, computer vision capabilities, and someone's hands and or eyes are not in the position where it's gonna promote the best trajectory, orientation, insertion, could we help prevent that? Right. I think that's very real. Um, yeah. not there quite yet, but uh, I think it's a great point, Inu. Yeah, and, and just then the headsets like in VR are getting more and more accurate with eye tracking and using trackers on your hands and things like that. So it works just as well with AR. So this is really, really powerful stuff coming on that area. All right, so he had yeah. another comment on huge accuracy, but then um, sounds like you know, you know, um, and he's talking about the lag um, for a probe projection. Um, I don't know if you see that so, one. Yeah. yeah, so luckily, um, you know, we've been really fortunate in that, um, you know, through through iterations, uh, we've we've been able to, our, our lag is in the milliseconds. Um, so it's it's imperceptible. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that actually is, is, is tremendously helpful. We've, um, you know, we had struggled with the lag issue for, for a while on the bench. And um, we just kind of kept on working with it and, um, I am very, very, very fortunate to be working with uh, some absolutely brilliant people. Um, you know, and uh, we've, you know, we've been fortunate enough to kind of uh, work on figuring that out. Maybe yeah. I can, can I nerd out for one second, Julie? You go. You, you nerd. I, I, uh, for everyone on the call, forgive me. I'm not going to ex uh, reveal exactly how we're doing it, but I'll, I will say this, right, is we've done some really interesting things with packet transfer and how the different ports that these headsets have on them and the file types that you send over, um, if you, you know, there, it's uh, uh, understanding the data input and, you know, and what is on the receiving end and how you can, you know, uh, mate those two together um, is, has a big impact on how, I mean, I'll just be very transparent. I mean, Dr. Martin's right now, we're in the uh, milliseconds, but in the past, yeah, you know, we, we had, um, we had perceptible lag early on, um, and it was something where being able to have that clinician feedback. Um, I would, one of my really good friends, Sharif Razak, um, I want to, there's a quote he has, I think we have to ask ourselves the question on what is good enough, not what's perfect. 
right? right? So when when is it good enough where it actually is better than what you have today, right? So that's one risk that I think we need to keep in mind with this technology is, uh, um, uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is we don't want to shut down the utility or adoption of the technology because it doesn't meet its end goal in the first iteration of minimally viable products of these technologies. We'll right. get, um, I was actually thinking about these things, right? Think about the first Palm Pilots, right? Even before that, the first Nokia's, right? People knew what was going to be possible with these, right? 25 years ago, but they started out with, you know, two, eight, three, and five. I can't remember if those are the right numbers for the snake, right? That's how you used to play snake, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, just to bring it back to um, one of the interesting comments here on that, though, this is different than a consumer component because it has to do with, um, with, uh, people's lives, right? So, so, you know, we always talk about, you know, doing it once is not medicine. Re repeating and being accurate and, and having outcome, that's in the medicine field. And so um, you guys are just getting it to the point where it's useful and now you're just getting it to the perfection stage there. So it sounds like, um, which leads right into the next question, which comes from, from Willie, which I want to bring forward is the hardware, I'm um, sorry, is the um, the is this a medical considered a soccer medical device and I think that's relative to the FDA you know assessment of it um, so is the software a medical device and I, I tell tell folks you know even my software using in headsets for finding buses with kids that are autism and things like that that was considered a medical device by the FDA through their new ruling in 19 uh, 2019 excuse me um, so he was asking, is this considered a medical device, the software? Um, so I, I'm pretty sure you're going to say yes to that, right? Or... Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, if, if you're, it, it depends on what class you're talking. It doesn't matter, right? It's class one, class two, class three, um, yeah. different levels of rigor, right? But it, they, they'll look at it as a system. They'll look at the hardware, they'll look at the software, they'll look at the interfaces, and it's it, the whole system is considered a, me a medical device, right? Yeah, so that's interesting. It's not just a software app. It's a it's a system that includes the headset and the software um, and the, the the components that go with it. Yeah, okay. So, so the next, an anonymous, a mysterious anonymous person is asking uh, whether you're using Euphoria for registration. Um, so I, partially. partially. That's, partially all I, yeah. that's all I'll say about that. Partially. Yep. And, and I would make it, I can have, I'll make it more broad. It's, it's a, there's a optical component. It is not all a registration. Yeah, there's some markers in it and you, you, whether you use Euphoria or some other marker technology, it's, it's okay. And then someone's asking about hygiene. Uh, Raham, I'm so, I hope I'm saying that right. Raham is asking about hygiene and COVID-19 to make sure it's clean. How do you, you know, the, I think that's the Dr. Warren, like are you cleaning it? How are you handling that in the ER? So um, we've been we've been fortunate. We actually have several headsets, so that kind of allows us to kind of minimize the transfer. Um, having said that, when we do when we do um, you know kind of transfer them from user to user, we have been um, you know kind of cleaning them. You know, obviously cleaning the 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 the, the bands and such uh, with a with a hospital grade you know kind of cleanser you know post procedurally. Um, we we don't. You know, uh, we we haven't been you know kind of uh, uh, cleaning the, the the visors per se. Yeah. Um. You know, just just because that's you know we we, we wouldn't want to uh, you kind of damage the optics there. But uh, there is there is some interesting work um, that you know we've been following as far as you know kind of other methods of effectively kind of cleaning and 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 uh, you know treating treating uh, headborne devices. And sort of a plug for other talks. This has come up in almost every single talk we've done about six now. Um, and some people are like, well, you know, we wipe it down. The others, there's technology like CleanBox where you put it in and you clean it up. Um, you know, so there's there's a, a number of different technologies. So some of our other talks get into this a little bit. Um, so somebody brought up, let's see, Willie, again, uh, about hardware updates and changes. And that may be coming to you, Mina, like, how, how's that hitting you? Um, how, how are you handling all that kind of stuff? Uh, I'm going to two things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's going to be, I'm going to talk about the beneficial side of it changing, right? It, it, over the next five years, these headsets, even on NPR, I mean, look at in real, right? Maybe not quite the full compute of a right. lens or a magic leap just quite yet, but it's a good thing, right? Because it's right. going to drive the price down. So from an adoption perspective, that's going to really help. Um, 
now from a yeah. whatever I'll call it victims right because of the changes of in hardware there's it's not just a simple port it's a true migration from you know if you're building in unity or unreal or you're building your own um, uh, base level uh, language to code for these things yeah there is a there's a little bit of uh, of uh, overhead right that you're gonna have to implement if you you know the partners around unity and in real and what they're doing I'm sorry unreal and what they're doing with the headset manufacturers is we're not I won't say reaching the plateau but you know these limited or sorry these long-term support embodiments of the software development environments that pair with the headsets now is minimizing it but you know I see it as both a benefit and of course with that comes the challenge of my headsets um, but I, I view it as a benefit I, you know, to the whole industry. Um, and, and yeah, there'll be some work, right? We're, you know, we're on the bleeding edge of this stuff. So will we have to modify our systems? Yes, I will give it, you know, I do want to say to our engineering team that we are doing as much as we can to make it hardware agnostic, at least to the parts of the system that can be, right? When the cameras change, when, when other sensors change, we'll have to adopt to that. But the parts that we can develop so that we don't have to start from scratch every time our group is very intentional about doing that and i think for an audience of people that sort of might play more with it than have been part of big companies that do software engineering um the retro fitting of testing and the qa teams are really powerful at some of these companies and they know exactly what use cases they have to retest if they're going to put products out on these moving you know, operating systems or platforms, right? So, um, so the next question I'll move to. Um, you may you may say, yeah, we can't get into this, but the um, another the anonymous is asking. Um, whoops, it's moving around. My questions are moving on the. Uh, how did you evaluate the registration accuracy? And I don't know if you can get into that at all. If you want to spend a second on that. Go ahead, Dr. Martin. I think you have a nice way of looking at this. Sure. Um, you know, we've been able to register or we've been able to measure accuracy, I guess, by uh, several methods. Um, you know, one, we're, we're kind of uh, using or comparing it to standard of care where, um, you know, using additional um, imaging modalities uh, to, to also kind of measure kind of our predicted versus where uh, we've ended. Um, and uh, thus far, uh, we actually, that's part of uh, in the paper that we've uh, um, have forthcoming kind of demonstrating some of this accuracy. It's uh, less than the average has been uh, less than two millimeters. Um, right. So, so we are actually um, you know, kind of demonstrating accuracy on our. It, rather, it's a it's a rather small data set, and obviously, it's a you know it's kind of single user. So, uh, it, it's it's part, it's part of our work is to kind of expand uh, expand utilization. And but um, you know we're even kind of showing on a bench top that. Uh, the, the method that we have is actually quite quite accurate. Okay, and then we have another question on haptics. I brought it up earlier, but um, Parasana, I believe, um, is asking um, whether you're looking at haptics for feedback, and are there any pilots in here? I, um, and that might be to you, Dr. Martin, more on the haptic side, or maybe even so, more. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I mean, personally, I know I know we've, we've been following the haptic space. Um, you know, just because of, uh, you know, I think where we've kind of been moving with the technology, we haven't in incorporated haptics into into our work thus far, um, which yeah, I'm sure, and, and me could certainly speak to this even more so, um, you know, I think that there probably would be some technical hurdles there to kind of, uh, you know, bring in to bring in yet another another component. Um, but I, I think that that could be, you know, very, you know, very interesting and super powerful with regard to kind of, uh, you know, bringing, blending that in. Um, I, I would be really excited, I guess, with regard to uh, some of the other questions here and, uh, you know, kind of discussions around haptics. I think that's ripe in the uh, education and simulation space. Right. And then, you know, kind of uh, yeah. as the technology continues to improve um, and we get some really good data around it, kind of then advancing it into the, uh, you know, kind of uh, right to the bedside in a, in a, in a clinical arena. I, I was actually gonna ask a follow up on that one saying, well, so one thing is to have the haptics to train where you're not really operating on a human, um, but um, but if you if if it were to bring value, would you see it in um, because it's a very visual component, and you're actually having the real haptics. But if you had haptics that gave you some sort of feedback in advance of something, you know, um, 
Um, but my question maybe there around the haptics is the learning curve that you need as a physician or as a surgeon in order to understand the haptics. Um, there is a lot going on there, but you know, that's really an interesting area to say, how do we make haptics another piece of input to your physical hands or something like that? You know, so. Yeah, I do want to, I mean, I, I do want to, I want to answer the question with the question, right? Is yeah. what is the end, what is the intended incorporating the haptics? Right. And, and Dr. Martin has some of the best hands I've ever seen, right? I've been in a lot of procedures and that you get, I mean, that is a lot of training, right? And I also want to say is, are we talking about haptics on the body or on the head? Or it, are we using the haptics for a notification system? And does it have to be haptics or could, could it be an auditory or a visual cue, right? That does that, that could that replace it? So I think training and simulation, there's a couple groups I want to give them a shout out, CAE Medical, right? I have no stock in them. I'm just, I've worked yeah. with, but they have three AR simulators that have done incredible work with haptics, right? And I see the true value in that because you don't have a live patient, the parts are moving. So I just want to just ask the question is what, what are we trying to incorporate the haptics for? And what's the end goal you're trying to achieve? Right, I think Dr. Martin was that, sort of saying the same thing too. It's like, what's it for, right? Um, okay, so we're hitting the hour. Um, I'm just going to take one minute and say, I just want folks to know that we have some upcoming talks. Um, let me just share my screen real quick um, and make sure that you are all aware that we have a talk on the 7th, October 7th, same time, 12 o'clock Eastern time. Um, and we are covering um, SARS. So that's a surgical uh, AR capability. Um, and then on October 28th, very exciting, um, Dr. Navi is going to speak. He's had 30 years of experience in, in spatial computing and OR suites and, and engineering prototypes. So that's really exciting talk as well. So just to plug those, then you can go to our medvr.io um, and then we can get back to the screen. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure I brought those up and did my job as the medvr person to bring up our talks. Um, and are you guys all ready to go for another 15 minutes on a few talks? Do you have the time? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so we've got a lot of, uh, a few more questions. Um, I think this is an amazing question from Thomas. Um, for Dr. Martin, in your experience of using a headset, does wearing it affect the communication among the staff, you know, in the OR? So that's a really interesting one, yeah. You know, um, I guess the short answer is yes, it affects it. Um, but uh, the, the way that I found it to affect it is actually in a quite a positive way. Um, it allows you to, to, to share the experience of the procedure, I think, in, in novel ways. Um, when every time we perform one of these procedures, um, the, the, you know, my colleagues, uh, my, the, the, the technologists I work with, the nurses that I work with, uh, you know, my patients, they, everybody wants to, you know, put the headset on and take a look. And I, I think it's, it, it communicates the, you know, kind of what we're doing in, 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 a, in a very novel way. Um, I mean, I've had, I've had, you know, nurses and technologists come up to, uh, up to me after the procedure and, you know, say, you know, literally say, you know, we knew that you guys did some really kind of complex procedures, but, you know, after seeing that, I didn't really understand the complexity. And yeah. um, you're able to kind of demonstrate that, I think, in a very different way. And uh, yeah. I think it could be really powerful that way. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I personally haven't seen any any uh, you know negative effects to the communication. It's, I think it's kind of allowed. I think it's spurred communication. I mean, the the any time anybody puts it on and kind of sees what you know what we're seeing and kind of we discuss what we're about to do, the the questions that come after are 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 always always fun and always uh, you know extra insightful. Again, I just the uh, ability to record what you do through these headsets too is just amazing to do a you know post-op conversation about it too. Um, so I think just from a learning perspective, that's crazy good as well, right? So um, so there's there's a uh, there's a next question um, that's more of a statement, I think, but I think it's worthy here is saying that advances seem to be coming slow. Like, is this legislative, logistical, like? What's, what is happening here? And I'm gonna zip it because boy, do I have an opinion on this one. Um, but um, so what would you say to Abel Rodriguez that has put that comment out there? Um, well, first, hello, Abel. Um, mm -hmm. 
also yeah, a, a, a colleague. Um, so, you know, I, I think bringing this technology forward is is I, I think it's a bit of a heavy lift, and, and there's there's a lot of a lot of pieces to it. Um, you know, I think that you know the the you know as Mita alluded to the actually the capital equipment is is expensive. Um, it, it's getting better with uh, you know with those from from Enreal and others you know kind of bringing the cost down a little bit. Um, you know I think that uh, it, it employs some skill sets that aren't really um, you know kind of native to to healthcare. So I think that kind of slows slows progression as well. Um, and uh, you know I, I think our colleagues from the FDA have actually done a tremendous job of actually kind of coming along with us, but. Um, you know, on a on a smaller scale, even within hospitals, um, you know, every time we go to uh, you know send in, uh, you know, before we're allowed to do research, we have to actually send our research to an institutional review board or IRB. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that process in and of itself is, you know, it, it's it's you know purposefully, um, right. you know, not complex, and 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 we appreciate that, but you know, there's there's so many people who are unfamiliar with the technology. So before you can even get into the merits of the actual physical research that you're doing, it's you know kind of bringing people along to to fully understand the technology and then how you're going to use it in a particular circumstance. So I it, you know it's it's a it's a great question and it's probably one that we could probably take another hour if not more to 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 get into. And also, Mina, you have to read all the rocket scientists to get the mathematicians. Right, they can do the, the data matching, right? So, so we, you know, Elon Musk has only so many people that you can take, right? So, in order to do the math, right? So, uh, all right. In all seriousness, we, uh, Stephen Patterson has put in a question about 5G, um, and will 5G um, help with the remote scenarios? So, I think that's a good one. Yeah, I, I want to. I think I'm going to answer that from a slightly different perspective. Five G, no doubt, is going to help, right? I mean, if you, it really depends on what we're talking about, right? I mean, we're talking about a, a local or wide area network. And yeah. Uh, you know, there's some really interesting, and I want to. Five G is going to help, right? That's the short answer. The medium length answer is, I think there's going to be a lot of work because of the emergence of these technologies um, that how healthcare institutions are gonna be more willing to open up their infrastructure and security in a secure way to allow the transfer of information is gonna be a really big question. Um, <clears throat> because if you talk about things around, um, especially in mixed reality or when we're um, bringing multiple data sources together at the same time, someone earlier talked about the hardware constantly changing. On, set, on, sorry, on device compute will get better, but the headsets today, even the highest end ones don't have the full compute power to run everything on device. So when you start needing the ability of a, another machine and are you sending that information out over a secure local network or right. just, um, I think that's going to be, and you know, there's some inter interesting work being done in this by a couple institutions. Look at AWS, look at Apple, this right. is the first help the first vertical for any industry is healthcare. It's very, you know, it's very intriguing as to why. And if you haven't listened to talks about that, please do. Um, AWS, right? My wife's a pharmacist, and she's like, "You think I'm gonna work for Amazon pretty soon?" And I'm like, well, maybe. Um, but they're trying to get into this field as well, around you know, securing data. So, 5G, no doubt, is going to help. I think there's a question around how healthcare institutions, CIOs, uh, CSOs, are gonna be willing to work with these type of technologies. Machine learning is a great example of one. You can run on a local GPU or, but then that's expensive infrastructure. And there's a lot of efficiency to be gained in running in the cloud, but there's also a greater security question. So there's all these trade offs. But yeah, that's a good answer. Um, and then we have a, another one. I'm, I'm moving right along because we got some, some that are really interesting here. Um, are there any procedures that are enabled by AR that couldn't have been done before? Um, you know, your future vision on, or any that are so drastically changed? I mean, do you see any future work that we've just had to walk away from, but AR will enable for us? That's a real far-reaching one. Yeah, um, you know, kind of without without getting into things too much. Um, I, I know personally, we we've had one case where 
you know, once we actually um, you know, kind of built the AR models and kind of actually saw it and kind of were able to kind of appreciate where everything was, we actually aborted the procedure just because we understood that it was actually too complex to, to perform this minimally invasively. Um, so, so I think that there's going to be opportunities like that where I think AR is going to allow people to, um, to obtain more information, better information, you know, prior to even touching the patient. So I think that that's going to go a long way right there. Um, you know, with regard to the the other, you know, kind of the other side of that, as far as you know, what what will AR will be able, will enable? Um, yeah, you know, I could I could see it in a lot of places. I, I probably you know it'd take way too long to kind of go into into some of the the, the longer discussion around that. So I'll kind of keep it short there. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And I, I think I want to bring up that Joe mentioned that yesterday the FDA announced the new Digital Health Center for Excellence. Um, so you should check that out. That's an exciting activity that's happened. Um, I know MedVR is, is really working to have a good relationship with the <coughs> FDA too. Um, so, um, and then the next couple are, are just comments. Um, and then we have um, that crazy anonymous person again on uh, what type of utilization of this technology poses the biggest um, the, um, poses the biggest drain on surgical procedures, you know, like, um, like, is it prep time? Is it setup time? Is it wearing, gowning? Like what, you know, I think this is like the difficulty of use kind of question. Is there anything that is a royal pain in your butt? <laughs> I can put it that way. Dr. Martin, like what's hard about using it when you, when you, when you suit up, what's it like? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's always the, 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 I, I, at least I probably should go back. I think the biggest, the biggest challenge with AR right now is just, you know, kind of building out the community, honestly, um, getting, getting people to understand what this is, you know, what AR is, what VR is. I mean, it's probably taking it back a little bit too far, um, but, uh, you know, kind of building awareness and building, building the community. Building like trust, um, yeah. even trust in the OR that you're using something. Yeah, yeah, 100% trust in the OR. I mean, you know, health, you know, how we in healthcare are, you know, predominantly evidence-driven, evidence-based beings, and you know, getting people there around this new technology is, you know, takes takes some time. You know, I, I, I you know, Mina and I have you know, kind of laughed about it a lot, where, uh, you know, the fir the first time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, people who, who use rear view, um, you know, rear view cameras, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I still, I mean, I'm showing my age. Yeah, I still yeah. kind of look back and I throw my, throw my arm behind, uh, you know, the, the, the passenger seat as I'm moving back and checking back behind me as well as looking at the camera. Whereas, uh, you know, there's some people, you know, I was driving with my uh, niece, uh, you know, a couple months ago and, you know, she, she backed up, you know, very vigorously, just looking at the camera, you know, and that's just a. Uh, okay, I'm with you, you know, on the age so, thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a, it's, it's just a techno technological hurdle that, um, you know, that I think you know we're we're working to to get out there, and it's, you know, and it's advocacy, and it's you know showing data and results, and you know showing showing you know value and quality, and and, and I think we could really kind of move on that. No. So for you as the user, it's a snap. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mina. Go. I just want to add a comment to that: is if you're building solutions like this, please look at the people that have to touch it. And right. what I mean is your techs, your uh, nurses. I mean, you know, uh, early technology. I guess MediView will uh, support right the field right to encourage the adoption, help people use it, understand how to use it. But long term both economically and because of the era of COVID and reducing the number of people that go into an OR, these systems have to be, uh, as, as our CIO, Greg Miller puts it, they have to be toasters. You push it, you know what to expect, pops up, pull it out, put some peanut butter, eat it, right? That's how these systems are going to have to work. So don't, um, my, I guess my main, my main uh, point here is look at, who all of your customers are, right? Doctor, the Dr. Martins of the world are a critical one, but his support staff are also critical because if they're the ones who have to set this up and prep it, if they don't like using it, guess it's not going to get adopted. So um, I just want to make sure that I, I call that out. And, 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 
today, all the people who are going to touch so we are running out of time and, I, and there are about seven more questions and I know that we probably cannot get to all of them. Um, there is a question, sort of a comparison between Augmetics and, you know, it's probably for you, uh, Nina, to talk about that one. How do you differentiate yourself in that area? If you want to take that on briefly, but then I have another one for Dr. Martin that I'd love to get to before we close. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll answer in two ways. I think comp competition is awesome. I, I, I applaud Augmetics, they're doing some excellent work in the spine space. Um, and I'm sure, just like this, we're thinking about utility beyond spine. Um, I'm going to, the second way that Dr. Mar and I think a lot about is uh, MediViews technology is differentiated because it's used on soft tissue, which is one of the most difficult applications of this technology, which allows it to be used then in other areas. Um, and I refer to how the incorporation of real time imaging with the volumetric scans accounts for the soft tissue deformation and movement. But also, I do want to call one thing out just so it's appreciated is our registration technique is different than anyone or anything else I've seen so far. And I've looked at quite a bit in this space. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying anyone is, has a bad technology. Ours is just different. And because of that, we're able to use it on um, a variety of anatomical structures that maybe have a, uh, a variety of registration requirements around them. So competition. Yeah, and if the audience doesn't know it, like you, I mean, Mina came to many of you and he looked at so many systems, right? Like he just scoured because of his background in medical tech, right? So, so he, even without many of you, he, you're such an interesting person to talk to about technology in general around this area. So we really appreciate it. Um, in perspective, um, the, um, maybe we can close with this one. That's it's sort of a couple different topics. Um, the the who's going to pay for it question. That's from Willie, and then interested in what's still not good enough in AR. You know, like so they're both like I know they're totally different questions, but they always seem to come together. Um, so the payment side, like how does this get paid for? You know pay for research to create the product or pay for the, the use of it? You know, is it insurance? You know, like how does this get paid for? Um, I think it's who's going to pay for it is a really interesting question. If you want to talk a few minutes about that, perhaps. Um, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I think that um, there, there's a, there's a couple ways. Uh, and, and this is yet another question that me and I talk about quite often. Um, you know, I think that uh, the initial payment uh, is going to come from uh, showing its, its utility in cases and showing its value in uh, making procedures safer, more efficient, and getting it so people can't do procedures, you know, want to do procedures, but they can't do procedures without it. Um, and, and through that, just like using ultrasound or CT guidance for a procedure, um, you know, we can kind of build in codes, and I, I think that that can happen. Um, you know, additionally, you know, in the short term, and, uh, you know, this is something else to me and I talked about, you know, I, and obviously I have a little bit of bias to this, but I also think that, um, you know, AR should probably avail itself of the same category C codes um, for development of the holograms that, um, that uh, the 3D printing community uses. Um, those, those codes are, are already there. They're experimental. I see no reason why not. Um, you know, there's obviously, I, I think that I, I see these uh, technologies as complementary. I think they're both, they both have tremendous uses in the healthcare space. And um, I give tremendous kudos to, to those who have, um, you know, come before us um, in the 3D printing world to kind of attain those codes. Yeah. I, I think that that could be, you know, a, it's a very easy way for us to start to show um, adoption, utilization, and, um, you know, to then kind of just drive, um, you know, different, uh, different opportunities within, you know, across different specialties to implement the technology. Great. There's yeah. a really interesting use condition there. If you look at 3D printing specifically, like the, I mean, it started out as a class three CPT code, right, which basically meant it was emerging technology that maybe would get reimbursed for some cases. If you look at an application of it today, in structural heart where 3D printing has actually moved to class two and class one CPT code because it's basically shown not to get too far into the weeds, but if you look at, you know, patient prosthesis mismatch, meaning your implant doesn't match your anatomical site, which causes chronic problems, 3D printing has been shown to help reduce that and holography 
and AR have, in my, you know, I agree with Dr. Martin, can build on top of those benefits that 3D printing have shown. And actually now you can use them both pre, intra and post-operative. So I think that trajectory with CMS is coming. Yeah. So we kind of need to close up, but there's a whole set of questions from one person here, uh, Bashkar. And um, the last one is really interesting. So if you don't mind one more, um, uh, how, how is moving around during surgery wearing AR affect its utility? Are you finding, I don't know, I can just imagine, I'll leave you with that one. I'm like, are you like, do you have to stand very still? You know, like, so that's a really interesting question for you. Um, you know, we've been pretty fortunate with, uh, you know, the current embodiment of the, uh, of the device that we use with the, with the software and the, um, uh, within our platform, the, the holograms actually remain stable. So we're actually able to freely remove, move around the table without, without seeing, uh, you know, without seeing drift. Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to, I want to thank everyone for the wonderful questions. And I just, Medvi, I want to thank both of you so much for your expertise thank and you. your time. And um, we're trying to raise so many boats and you've just really raised the boats. Good deal. So thank you for coming. And uh, if everyone could hear us, we'd all be clapping for this talk. It was so insightful. So thank you very much. And thank everyone for coming. And don't forget our upcoming talk on the 7th. And uh, we'll bid you adieu. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, Matt VR. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, our pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye, all. Take care. Cheers. Bye.